Edwin de Bose Hayward was an American writer. Born in 1885 in Charleston, South Carolina, the son of Edwin Watkins Hayward and Jane Scruen. His parents were dispossessed as a result of the Civil War, his father working at a rice mill, dying in an industrial accident when Edwin was free. His mother was forced to sue, open a boarding house, and to collect Gula folk tales and perform them for an audience. Hayward did not receive a higher education and suffered from ill health, contracting polio at age 18. In 1913, he had his first play, An Artistic Triumph, performed in public. Despite lukewarm reception, he continued in his literary efforts. His first short story was published in 1918 in Pagan, a magazine for eudaimonists. At this time, he founded an insurance business with his friend Henry T. O'Neill. In 1923, he married future playwright Dorothy Coons, the pair having one daughter, actress Jennifer DuBose Hayward. In 1925, he wrote his most famous work, Porgy, a novel of black life in Charleston, which made him ostracized in some corners of the city. In 1927, he and his wife adapted the novel into a play. And then in 1935, they worked with Ira and George Gershwin to produce the opera version Porgy and Bess, which was, however, a flop. Hayward then turned to writing more novels critical of the South, such as his 1931 play Brass Ankle, while additionally lecturing on Southern literature at Porter Military Academy. He also became the dramatist for Dock Street Theatre. He died in 1940 in Charleston. Today we will review the one item of fantastic fiction he seems to have written, his 1929 novelette, The Halfpin Flask, taking place on the fictional Ediwanda Island, an island populated entirely by descendants of former slaves. The narrator, a certain Mr. Courtney, is awaiting the arrival of Barksdale, someone recommended from his club to come down for some research. And the first thing Barksdale says when he arrives on the island is that he wants to research Negroid primates, and he sees nothing wrong with this, when Courtney very aptly takes umbrage with the term. He further asserts African Americans hold no vestige of their ancestral beliefs, and says the blacks are starting out at zero with everything to learn from our wonderful civilization. And the very first thing he does is to steal a glass medicine flask from a cemetery where it was used for a grave marker. Courtney tries to stop him, but he arrogantly refuses and hides the flask to put in his collection. But somehow the native population seemed to know. No one saw them, but all the native domestics up and quit all at once, and the help taken from the mainland quits that very same night, despite being praised for her work ethic. But that isn't all. Soon the two men, sharing the same apartment, are stricken with a bout of insomnia, which starts and seems to emanate from Barksdale himself, in real, tangible, physical waves of raw energy, making any and all rest impossible. As the days turn into weeks, the two losing track of time, and as the islander's music slowly turns into something far more sinister than mere dance, until Courtney finally sees her, a woman born from an undulating wave of heat, taking on the form of Barksdale's great humiliating lost love, drawing him from the apartment in a mad daze, Courtney in slow, agonizing pursuit. But though he knows this is the coming of Plat-Eye, the malicious spirit who leads men astray to their demise in the jungle, he presses on and finds Barksdale, and he is, despite all the ominous atmosphere, unharmed. The flask is returned, and everything is back to normal. The obstinate Barksdale asserting it was all nothing but jungle fever, the story ends before it has a chance to get nasty, sad to say, but is still ominous enough. 